We're dealing with the archaeological reality. We're dealing with a story which has grown up. And then we're dealing with the Romans' capacity to put that story onto the monuments that they themselves see. It's part of my DNA, it's part of my culture, it's part of Rome. It's part of Rome. As a child, you would hear myths being told by your nurse or your mother or your grandfather. Greek myths were something which people experienced from the cradle to the grave. The world of myth was the entire imaginative and philosophical world of the culture of the Greeks before the invention of philosophy and drama in about the 5th century. So if they were trying to work out how responsibility and ethics and, and guilt work, then actually they would think about someone like Helen at Troy. Did she cause the Trojan War? Or was it the gods who caused the Trojan War? Or was it maybe the Greeks being uh, very keen on, on expanding an empire? You know, they, they, they bashed through basic problems of ethics by thinking about myth. When Augustus comes to power, his use of myth, his use of his genealogy, his use of these foundational myths of Rome isn't something that comes from nowhere. It's critically important to understand what Augustus does as part of the power play of the late Republic, which involves critically using the foundational stories. He came to power after 15 years of civil war and he inherited a very fragmented community and he used the foundation myth to give people a sense of communality, of common origins and of social unity. And it's one of the keys to Augustus' success that he so successfully manipulates and monopolises those stories for his family and his person, making it very difficult afterwards for anyone else to get access to the constitutional foundations and beginnings of Rome. Travelling groups of actors took these plays across the entire world and everybody absolutely loved it. The Greek world was theatre crazy. The number of people going to see the plays might have been 10 to 14,000. I mean, in terms of the audience, it's probably more like a sort of football match or a pop concert than it would have been what we understand as a play. I understand the horror of what I am to do. But anger, the spring of all life's horror, masters my resolve. We're dealing with explorations, we're dealing with thought experiments, testing to destruction. Those are the kinds of things which tragedies are about. Ovid manuscripts were produced at lots of different levels for lots of different kinds of consumer. This is an aristocratic one. You definitely get the sense as you look through um, medieval or Renaissance illuminations that the artists are, are taking these myths from the text and they're making them their own and they're making them relevant to a contemporary audience. One of the great things about the foundation myths is that they are extraordinarily dramatic. And you have a wonderful confluence, I think, of two different things. You have popes and political leaders who are desperate to show the way that they're connected to the past and the great history of Rome. You also have painters who want interesting things to paint. The myth was so highly valued at the time, um, it wasn't enough for a statue just to be old. It had to have its own story as well and its name. We're talking about the myth of Pygmalion, which Ovid tells in Book 10 of his epic poem, The Metamorphoses. This myth has been taken up through the centuries, actually, in literature and art and in cinema. There's always an issue about slavery and ownership. 
and robots most often are constructed to do the jobs that other people don't want to do. Although I'm not suggesting that Pygmalion has um, sculpted a slave for himself, he has certainly sculpted a compliant woman who will be faithful only to him. Io credo che la mitologia esista ancora, non la dobbiamo perdere, altrimenti riusciamo a per... rischiamo di perdere la nostra identità. Thank you.